Hello world, my name is Data Mining Mike and in this episode of the podcast we are going to talk about how to become a real estate agent. Today we have Jake Beal. He is a comedian, musician, songwriter, community organizer, theologian, and hands down the most creative and best expert real estate agent in Spokane, Washington 2023. Jake is very articulate, salt of the earth man. He certainly has a relaxing voice and at the very end of this podcast he gives you lucrative advice to save tens of thousands of dollars on your next home purchase. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you have learned and apply it to your home buying experience or real estate career. That's called value. And because of that, you should like this video and Jake's videos too. Remember that sharing is caring. Check out his links in the video description below. Be sure to subscribe to what he does. But first, here's how you can get rich. You know all those fires that have been happening in Hawaii? Hawaiian Electric, or ticker symbol HE, is on sale at half a price it usually is and is running at $15 a share, usually going at $40 a share. Just wait till it gets into the single digits, then really start throwing money at it. Hawaiian Electric is a quality energy stock. It's literally part of the infrastructure of the island. That usually pays a dividend too and will most likely recover. Hawaiian Electric, ticker symbol HE. Tell the world about you. <laughs> well, I'm I'm Jake, uh, or Jake the Realtor. Uh, I do lots of goofy, wacko sort of pizzazzy things on the interwebs. <laughs> and we're drinking beer right now, so you can't hold us liable for the things we say. Sounds good. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I like, uh, as far as my business goes, I like to make lots of weird, funny videos related to real estate and Spokane. Yep. Um, so I have a good time with that. Been in real estate for about five years. Uh, lived in Spokane my entire life, except for a three-year stint where I went to uh, commu- or, sorry, I went to uh, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Uh, that was killer. Uh, had a great time there. Lots of good food. Uh, I keep on thinking about this burrito place that was nearby uh, our school. That's totally inconsequential to the interview, but. The burritos in Chicago are pretty good. <laughs> oh, I hear the food there is phenomenal. Mm. The food there is killer. So I'd, I'd go back for the food. Wouldn't go back to live there, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. So you, so where? What have you been doing up to now? What have you do, been doing for hobbies? So other than real estate, I got my, I got a couple degrees in music. So I'm a very degreed hobbyist when it comes to music. <laughs> good. Uh, I, I do lots of various things. Like I'll, I'll uh, write some singer songwriter type stuff here and there, or I'll uh, do a choir piece every once in a while. Uh, and then this is super random, but I studied Japanese for about ten years. That's cool. Um, so I'm I'm kind of maybe picking it up. I'm testing out an app to see if I like it, just for fun. Test like uh, testing what out with an app. Uh, so there's a lot of new apps in the language world that are coming out right now because of chat GPT where you can kind of have a conversation with uh, a robot, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is great because then you don't have to worry about messing up and making a fool out of yourself in front of a person. And then you can ask the computer what kinds of grammatical mistakes that I make and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So there's some language model that you can talk to in Japanese right. and you can bounce. That's really cool. Yeah, not saying I'm great at it, but it is something I studied a lot. Well, then you would enjoy doing jujitsu. <laughs> I tried, I didn't like it. Oh, okay, so yeah. you did try it. <laughs> At least Brazilian jujitsu. Yeah, 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 Brazilian jujitsu. Yeah, what was wasn't for me. Yeah, too uh, too sweaty and up close and personal. Really is. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. I'd rather do boxing. I think if I was going to get into a, a physical sport, I think boxing would be more my speed. Muay Thai is really excellent. Would it be fun? Yeah. Yeah, I like watching it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. My first time seeing Muay Thai was in Thailand when I was, you know, went on deployment and went to Thailand Rap. and saw that. Yeah. 
Dude, Thai food is no joke when it comes to food. Oh, yeah. It's delicious. It's delicious, man. For like 120 bucks American, I was living like a king back in, back then at when I went there. I believe Phuket. it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a different world. You watch how um, the Thai kids, like they, the boys go to school only because it's the law. Right. And then when they go home, they kick palm trees because they have to fight for their family's income. That's part of their family's income. Weird. Yeah, so they cockfight these boys. And my first time seeing it was there in, in Phuket. So I like paid a dollar and I went into this pretty big arena. And uh, they're just playing their little like crazy little, uh, flute music. And then the boys go out, they go to pray in each corner, and then they go and they start fighting each other. And it's a big deal. Crazy. Yeah, it's a second world country in Thailand. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, cool man. Other than um, music, I don't I don't have a ton of hobbies. I work quite a bit and play when I can, and uh, that's that's about it. Cool. With my family. Cool. So, where do you see the Spokane real estate market going? Uh, I mean, well, part of it depends on what part of the market you're talking about. Um, mm. As far as like generally residential. Uh, I think that, I mean, there's a number of things happening right now. I'm not an economist, but this is just my guess as a realtor. I think that we're looking at a a couple years uh, plateau, like the the market not doing a whole lot up or down. Uh, The interest rates aren't great right now, so there might be some downward pressure. But I think once the interest rate rates give up a little bit, like they go back down, we'll probably see the prices pop back up. But in mm-hmm. Spokane, for particular reasons, one is it's a high, it's a, it's a common place for people to move to right now. So a lot of my clients are from out of town. Um, so, I mean, that means that there's a lot more demand for the supply that we do have. Uh, there's been some additional restrictions on, not restrictions, but fees been given to the builders. So that means that it's also going to put a bit more of a squeeze on the demand and then once again with the fires that happened there's going to be a bit more short of not just supply but the ability for I mean just to even get back to ground zero we're going to have to build houses for the people that lost their houses um, before the builders are going to be able to really make a big dent in the amount of homes that we need so we're pretty far behind on supply mm-hmm. which is probably going to press the prices back up which is yeah. between supply and demand okay that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense because of that. So we, you've had, so still, yeah, you have a short housing shortage mm-hmm. and it's not really been a, well, it's not getting any better in Spokane. Right. So tell me about the clients that you usually get. I, I work with a variety of clients, uh, mostly from uh, my sphere of influence, friends, family, the network group. Uh, Spokane Biz Club. Go check it out if you're uh, a business owner in Spokane. Spokane Biz Club. Spokane Biz Club, all the way. Um, so that's been a, whole, a huge blast. And I work with a lot of veterans and then some people from TikTok and other social media stuff that we do. That's cool. Yeah. That's good. So you have a really solid network that you're very much actively building. Yeah. So I, I've been building up a business network for for probably a couple years now and it was just something I, I knew that I wanted to be a part of when I uh, I was getting coaching and, and the coaching a lot was emphasizing on the importance of solid professional relationships and so one of the things they suggested on doing was building your own network group or going to a lot of network groups and I just thought building one was more my speed um, so uh, Yeah, I just went to go meet with all the business owners I could. At first, we were meeting at different breweries around town and then um, found out that Val from Huckleberry Press uh, was interested in building one as well. And so I asked him if he'd want to do it with me and then asked on our Facebook group if anybody had a place that we could just meet once a week so that way I didn't have to plan a new place every every month. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I thought maybe a weekly meeting would be cool too. Uh, We thought that as a group. Uh, and then Morgan from Mad Collab offered her place. I was like, well, sweet. Let's give this a go. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's been killer. Um, 
So uh, just getting to meet lots of new professionals in the area, uh, really from every different industry and, and new to me, not just saying new, new to the entrepreneurial space, but um, it's been a great way to meet people and have a good time. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a very powerful thing you got going. It's very important, yeah, very, very meaningful. Very too. blessed by it. Yeah, very, very good thing. Um, have you noticed a lot of Californians moving here? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're moving from everywhere. Californians, Texans. Um, that's probably the two biggest that I get is California and Texas, but more than just that, like Colorado and so forth. How many want to see the house versus don't want to see it? I mean, most people want to see the house before they live in it, right? Yeah, you would assume so. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while, you have somebody that can't. Uh, mm. Like they're moving from out of town and, and they aren't able to get over here before they need to have a house. So what I'll do for them is I'll, I'll normally take a video of the property so that way they can see what the house looks like. Uh, then we're making decisions based on the uh, inspection report. It's preferable to get into the house, though. Yeah. Yeah, my sister just bought a house in Wenatchee because, uh, well, the owner, the former owner refused to sell to a Californian, flat out. He said, I'm only selling to locals. Wow. And he sold, them, sold the house to him for like 400 grand, which is a lot yep. for me. In hindsight, given how much it just keeps exponentiating these prices, yeah, yeah the prices are nuts. Like it's uh, definitely getting a lot. Uh, when I started real estate back in 2018, the average home price was still in the 200s. Like it was like 290, I think was the average price point. Right now, 2023, we're sitting at about 415. Yeah. So. 20% year over year growth is nuts. That shouldn't happen in the real estate market. Again, part of that is supply and demand. Some of that was the availability of money. So mm -hmm. when the interest rates were just getting stupid low, like sub 3%, money was almost free. It made it really easier for people to, to afford higher price points because there was almost no disadvantage to it. Now, when you buy a house now, it, it might still be comparable to your uh, rent, but you're probably downgrading from your lifestyle most of the time. That's where the difficulty is. Okay. Yeah. So like, if you're paying, say, $3,000 in rent, you might have a, like, a really nice rental where if you buy your first home at $3,000, it's, it's going to be probably lesser quality than what you had as a rental, which is somewhat common. But I mean, during, during like the pandemic, you could almost walk across the line staying you know, dollar for dollar the same or a little bit less as a, as a purchase. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting how it, how it grows. And in my next question, which you kind of alluded to, oh, and people, just so you know, these GoPros are not made for sustained filming, so I get what I get out of it, and that's about it. Because <laughs> I don't have, you know, I hey, I don't ha I don't spend a lot of money on like uh, no, film good, equipment. My 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 philosophy is have good audio, because mm -hmm. that's what Nick Allard said. He says people will forgive shitty video but they won't forgive True. bad audio and I'm like all right I'll do that I'll get as much of the video as I can on the podcast and then from that it goes black and then my expectation is my hope is that people will just want to listen to it yeah with a black screen versus like oh you know like the Joe Rogan podcast continuous right things but then again when i think about like the long form podcasts i'm not really watching it, i'm just listening so yeah. i'd be like cleaning my house or doing something or like so do you listen to podcasts i do yeah i listen to quite a few podcasts um some are, are professional in nature um but I, I do listen to a lot of uh more christian related podcasts and stuff like that maybe as it pertains to defense of the faith or uh christian living and stuff like that that's, that's normally what I'm listening to. Good. Good. Yeah, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I grew up Catholic, and all, all my family's Catholic on both sides. But okay. it wasn't until I 
my ex-wife that I went into started to see the other uh, denominations of Christianity and I started to see what I liked and started to just come together with my own uh, formulation of of you know my personal relationship with Jesus and and yeah yeah and and it's helped yeah the, the only thing to know about me is I mean uh, if, if you want to put a label to it I'm probably closest to a reformed Baptist five-point Calvinist and then uh, on the defense side of things I'm what's known as a uh, Vantillian presuppositionalist which is a longer word than it needs to be a Vantillian presuppositionalist right. <laughs> okay um, uh, es- essentially what all those labels mean is what I hope they mean is that I do my best to read scripture mm-hmm. and say this is the word of God and uh, I should submit to it and interpret my life by its lens rather than the scripture by my lens but the, okay. the Protestant doctrine of um, perspicuity of scripture is, is like the uh, clarity of scripture like it, it, it interprets itself is the Protestant view and so Basically, what I'm saying is all, all those labels I just said hopefully boil down to just God's word says what it does and I'm trying to follow it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And the older I get, the more I really think deeply mm-hmm. on the words of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of very deep <clears throat> meanings between the things he says and whatnot. And, and I think, like, I guess one question is, what do you think Jesus meant? by I am the bread of life. Well, I think the the primary thing that he was teaching in those statements is that he is the way to the Father. Mm-hmm. There is no other way but by him. Um, so that that is to say that in one instance, you have to have a knowledge of who Christ is from how he, he talks about himself. Like... Um, I know this isn't a religious podcast, but just because we're on the topic, if if I was talking to someone that say a Mormon who I, I love the Mormons in Spokane, I think they're great people. I I disagree with them very much as it comes to the validity of their faith. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because if we're talking about who Jesus is, um, we have a very different definition. So, uh, do, you, do you have a sister or a brother? Oh yeah, I'm the oldest of five. Okay. Um, let's say I said I knew your uh, next the next oldest in life is that brother a uh, sister so sister my sister Annie yeah. and Annie um, so let's say I say I, I know Annie and let's say I, I listed like 10 things about her that were like oh yeah yeah she's into I'm just making this up but she's into volleyball she's uh, she really likes walking on the beach and you're like yeah 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 yeah, yeah and she um, she likes hiking. She likes doing X, Y, and Z. She has a very funny personality. And Boulder was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then she has red hair. Hmm. And d- does she have red hair? No. Okay. So let's say I, I, I said 10 things that are like, yeah, totally. She's exactly like that. And then I was like, yeah, and she has red hair. And you're like, well, no, hold on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're, that's not the person we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So I say same thing with Jesus, but when we're talking about Christ's nature, and as a Protestant, I believe he is the second person of the Trinity, or God come down in the flesh. Yes. Yeah, so you believe in a Trinity. Yep. That's important. Yep. That's an establishment of like where Christianity stands versus mm-hmm. other Christian sects. Right. Yes. Um. So I say unless we're talking about that Jesus, then we're talking about. A different person altogether. Now that's the subject of Christ's ontology, which is the, you know, what is the actual true substance of who he is. Mm-hmm. Now the example with your sister, I was just talking about hair, but most people would be like, like if you can't get their hair right, you're not even talking about the same person, mm-hmm. right? And so talking about Christ's actual nature, if you can't get that right, then we're talking about a different Jesus. Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't mean that everybody has to have like a doctorate in theology to get it right. Um, but I am saying that if you are if you are disagreeing with what is clear in Scripture, 
and I, I think that his deity is clear in scripture, um, then we're, we're not talking about the same Jesus. So when he says, I am the bread of life, he's saying, I, I am the only thing that is sustaining you. In faith in him is the thing that saves. Um, now, there, there's various ways to take, take that particular statement, but that's a lot of what he is saying is that I am the way to the Father. There is no one except through me. Mm-hmm. I totally understand that, and I get that too. Oh. And, and, and I can extrapolate more to that because uh, of my experience in Afghanistan, and it really made me think about this. Because when I would sit down with the Afghans and I would eat with them, Mm -hmm. because they literally live basically in that Mm -hmm. time, um, I realized that one, Jesus never ate at a table. Mm -hmm. He squatted down like everybody else. A table was like a a luxurious Roman thing. But so he's squatting down. But what the Afghans do and what a lot of people do is they have these massive things of bread and they rip the bread and they hand the bread out to everybody. And that's what he was doing during this last supper so he rips the bread and he hands out and everybody uses that bread too as Mm. the utensil so there's no forks or anything it's either your hands or the bread and so they're using the bread and it and i think of that too like this bread is the tool too like so he is like a tool a way of life like without this sort of bread you're gonna be eating your food uncivilized like a human with your hands that's interesting uh, I, I'm not sure about the table or the food. I think there there are references to tables. Yeah, and 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 that's just me running my mouth based on an anecdote. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so kind of an interesting segue to that. Um, the the reason I uh, I'm a goofball online, but I I don't mean to sound like a stickler in person. Like I, I I am joyfully and excitedly a Christian, and I'm taking hopefully theology into the area of business, and I, I'm excited about it. Like I'm, like this. Yes, this is life. This is exactly what we're supposed to do. Um, so what I have the Bible open to is the beginning of Proverbs. Which okay, is, which is I the, love Proverbs. Yeah, so like the the book of wisdom, right? Like that. This mm-hmm. is um, the 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 sayings in Scripture that. Uh, are to be taken as like the, I guess the short little nuggets of wisdom that we should be uh, chewing through through our days, right? Um, and in the first chapter, uh, verse seven, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, and I, I don't mean to be... Um, overly uh, ostracizing it you know there's probably people that are listening to this that aren't Christian or I don't, I don't know where anybody is that is listening to this but uh, as a Christian I, I do hold to the, the fact that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge so I'd say that 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 knowledge is the predicate for any true knowledge about a particular thing so as it pertains to, to business or good podcasting or to whatever, um, my aim is to set the Lord and what he's said in his word as the first thing before the thing that I'm aiming to. Um, so we, we chatted a little about that a little bit at MAD. Uh, but that's, that's my hope and my aim and my prayer that, uh, for instance, excuse me, I'm burping a lot over here. I'm trying to not put it in the microphone. Yep. It's all good. <laughs> Um, yeah, my, my aim is that as I observe and look at my business, that I could model it after what God has said in his word, uh, as opposed to the philosophies of men. Um, so there's lots of business books out there, let's say, and I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with reading them, but I wouldn't want to wholesale agree with them either without kind of using scripture as a a filter um, and spitting out the bone, so to speak. Um, so in a, an instance for that is I was listening to a very popular realtor on YouTube and he, and he was giving an ad to why did sign up for his coaching uh, program. And his statement was, um, how do you become the best realtor in your market space? And his answer was getting leads. 
And it just dawned on me like like four or five months ago that what a way to treat your clients that God has graciously given you as cattle. Right? So if, if you're saying that your primary job to be good at what you do is to just get as many people through the door as you can. Where I think that the biblical model toward uh, labor is a function of what Jesus says, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then I mean, th- through the Old Testament, like it talks about labor as a function of uh, caring for those around you. So I would rather not see my business as something that's um, primarily to make me wealthy. Hopefully not. And uh, I pray for blessing for me and my family, but that's, that's not to be my goal, and I hope that it's not ultimately my goal, but rather it is to love my neighbor and, and pray that I can make their lives a little bit better by serving them. Good. So, Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of a book I read, and then I made an audio book out of it. It's called The, the Man Nobody Knows. The man, Yeah, The Man Nobody Knows. It's about... Story of Jesus as a business entrepreneur. Interesting. Yeah. It was written in the 1920s, so it's in public domain. That's why I read it out loud. I remember I had this uh, professor who told me about it, and he said it was a controversial book and like slammed it as like sacrilegious. And I, I'm like, okay, well, then it's got to be a good book. Mm-hmm. So I started reading it. I'm like, this is not sacrilegious or controversial at all. And, and, and so I decided to just read it as a as an audiobook, but it made a lot of sense. So you, what I think a lot of, what I think you feel like you're going for is you want a business model of influence. I, I want a business model where Christ is honored Mm -hmm. and hopefully he is the one influencing. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I know that I'm, I'm gaining somewhat of a following on, social media and you would classify that as an influencer so to speak I mean one level that makes me nervous like I, I uh, I'm excited about it and with the possibilities that entails I wasn't so much expecting um, the uh, I'm not to say that I'm crazy successful like we have a few thousand followers Um but it, it just it's dawning on me what kind of responsibility that is right like I, I want to make sure that if I'm saying something as a true thing that it's hopefully prayerfully more more rigorously tested than just just kind of run my mouth mm. you know um, like a lot of the things that I say are, are mostly comical so, again, we were talking about this the other day, but I, I would rather see uh, the majority of my content be humor-related or relatable because I think that is taking marketing and applying the principle, at least for my personality. This isn't everybody. I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. This is just what came to mind when I thought, how does Jake be a Christian and market? Mm. So I want to be applying the biblical principles of loving your neighbor God the neighbor and applying it to marketing and the output for me seemed to be 80% humor (laughs) because I think that's that's what I would like to see in my feed or or see down the street on a common basis is humor before seriousness that's what I prefer not everybody's going to like that Not, not every consumer is going to like that but I know that's what I like. So if I'm kind of putting my neighbor in my shoe, myself in my neighbor's shoes, that's what I wanted to see. So. Good. No, that's an important factor. So you've, you've, you've realized that humor is a very good selling point and that's what mm-hmm. you want. And that's the sort of clients you're going to be attracting. Right. And that's good. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's helpful to know who my audience is. Uh, and the kind of people that 
uh, would want to be around me. And a lot of them are going to be total goofballs just like me. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, good. Well, I mean, you brought up a good point. So how do you, how, what is your process, what's your thought process like before you create content? It depends. Uh, right now I'm still kind of in a, uh, a groove where I, I like to create one thing a day. Um, I think that's going to change though because I, I want to invest more time and money into creating more individual pieces of content and by which making them better, hopefully. Yeah. Um, which means I'd have to create less of them to do that. So Mm -hmm. leveraging time and money to make better content, I think is going to be more my speed. But as far as the the process goes, um, it kind of depends on what kind of content. Because if I'm creating real estate humor, I'm mostly just thinking about uh, what's a common experience to realtors like if you're looking at a Venn diagram, what's a common experience to realtors that the public would probably be aware enough of that they would think it's somewhat humorous. Um, so sometimes I'm just taking notes to the day. Like uh, you know, you're, you're driving through your own neighborhood and you see someone else's realtor sign. And so the joke would be, or the bit might be, a realtor taking a baseball back and smacking it down, you know? <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. <laughs> no, not encouraging that sort of thing, but like there's a relative relatableness for all realtors. Like, oh man, I live right next to them and I didn't get them as a client. I should have told them I'm a realtor, you know? Um, and then most people in your audience would probably get that as well. But hopefully they, they would recognize that, that that's not me as a person. I'm making fun of the fact mm-hmm. that that's how all realtors kind of react internally to that same kind of potential envy, which is something that I think most people struggle with. They see something they could have had or could have wanted and could actually have obtained, but because they weren't as thinking ahead of their neighbor, they see the success of somebody else. It's like, Oh shoot, I could have done that. Um, so mostly I'm just like, I'm poking fun at the obvious. You say the quiet parts out loud. A lot of humor is like that. Either the quiet parts out loud or there's a twist. Well, you, you nail some good ones too. Thank you. And, and like even some of your review, uh, your reactions where you're just, like the one where you're oh, the one lady who was like saying crap about like common things in Spokane and you're like totally messing oh, up. Yeah. That was funny. That was <laughs> yeah, funny for, for Spokane. Like I, I tried to, that. That one actually, I thought was hilarious because, um, I made a video where another realtor in town was saying the correct thing, like a much more postured way. And she's, she's a great realtor too. Um, and she was saying, how do you say things in Spokane? It's Chini, not Chine, it's Gonzaga, not Gonzaga. And when she was like right in between, you can do that duet video style where you're next to the video that you're responding to. I was saying even more ridiculous pronunciations of those words, like I was saying Chiny or mm-hmm. Gonzorga. And what was so funny about that is that um, the comment section on YouTube blew up. And people like thought that I actually wasn't from Spokane and weren't getting that it was a joke, <laughs> which is so much better. I love that. That's so great engagement. Good. Oh yeah. It was fantastic engagement. And the fact that like 20% of the viewers felt the need to correct me and say, that guy is totally wrong. <laughs> Made my day. <laughs> good. Yeah. Good. That was a creative way that you were able to get a lot of engagement and you nailed something too which is people want to correct complain Mm -hmm. teach and brag yeah one of those four things so so you nailed that um so how do you go about finding the titles how do you go about titling a video most of it just kind of comes to me at the moment um i kind of try to think of like the big buzzwords in a video and just put those in the title Mm-hmm. Uh, short, quick, simple. Um, I'm tr- I'm trying to. I mean, this might be way out there, but I'm trying to study Mr. Beast because he's a genius when it comes to 
making videos, but also titling and thumbnailing videos as well. Mm -hmm. um, like, man, the, the, the titles are so incredibly simple that th when you look at them, it's like a baby could think of that. But that's part of the point is like, if you can make it an easy concept enough that lots of people will like maybe had that thought, oh yeah, what would happen if I dropped a, a semi truck on top of a bus? You know, like, <laughs> like that's, that's a very, it doesn't seem overly creative, but his simplicity of ideas is what drives that kind of engagement. Um, so like, I fed 10 hot dogs to the uh, the garbage goat downtown, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. <laughs> or maybe 100 hot dogs. I, I fed 100 hot dogs to the garbage goat downtown. Like that that would be a more engaging video, something that would be fun. Don't steal that idea. I'm thinking on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever think that you would say, when I grow up, I want to be like somebody younger than me? <laughs> because I tell people that too. I love Mr. Beast. Yeah. Um, I guess I never really thought of it that way. Um, I guess it doesn't doesn't surprise me all that much because there's, there's always going to be very talented people that are younger than you, always. Mm -hmm. And he's just one of those one of a million that had a very particular skill and he's been developing it since he was like ten. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's only like three years younger than me. I think maybe four. Because I think he's born in his twenties, late twenties. Yeah, he's in his. 20s yeah okay um so i'm 33 so i don't i don't look at i'm getting a little too gray for that <laughs> well that happens yeah that happens <laughs> i'm 38 so yeah <laughs> well you're less gray than i am well thank you I, it's the msg i eat a lot of msg <laughs> there you go yeah um so yeah like, as far as good titles go stick to the buzzwords so people can find it um, but then the better you can uh, you know, think think of ideas that are even more simple than what they're looking for seems to there seems to be something in there so if you're thinking about creating YouTube content one I would say like I I did a lot more on TikTok than before YouTube mm -hmm. I just think that the YouTube algorithm is a little bit more favorable to creators that are uh have smaller followings it seems like on, on shorts hmm. um, well, I say just make a bunch of stuff especially because we, we have the short form videos now you can test so many things um, it, there's almost no reason to not like if, if you are not that embarrassed by stepping out in, in front of the camera and just seeing what happens just go for it mm -hmm. and just make hundreds of videos yeah good so you so I noticed you did that which is outstanding and you've gotten like 1.7 subs in a very quick amount of time. Yeah. Well, oh, which uh, I think that boils testament boils down to testament of your content quality. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. I think that's kind of... So, so that's another question I, I ask people. How do you think the algorithm the bots the machine learning models how do you think they see the world your content or anything uh, I, I mean there's obviously something to the algorithm but i think that what again what mr b says about it is right that if you just make good content the views will be there even if it is like it's it's one person that watches it all the way through and like oh man my friend has to see this you know but I mean, ultimately youtube wants you to watch stuff so if you're you know, if, if you can see a large amount of your viewers are sticking around and watching the full 11 minutes, then they're going to share it with more people because they also want other people to stick around and stay for the whole 11 minutes. Okay. So you're thinking 11 minute episodes? Uh, just in general. Like it could okay. be 20, 30 minutes. Just, um, or like for me, it's short. So if I can get somebody to watch uh, one and a half times through my shorts, um, they're going to come back for more and they're going to, YouTube is going to recommend more of my video to somebody. Mm -hmm. And I find that like uh, partially because my, a lot of my stuff is Spokane humor. People in Spokane don't see a lot of content about Spokane in particular jokes about Spokane. Mm. It's true. Uh, except for the meme pages. So mm. right now I have a bit of a monopoly on the, 
the Spokane jokes on the video. Cool. Good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Someone's got to. Yeah. Until someone else comes into the space and come up with good competition. So, mm-hmm. waiting for it. <laughs> good. No, that I mean, I've noticed that about yours because you are the only realtor in Spokane that I've came across that is adding humor kind of like... Oh, modern family ish, kind of like that Jim D- is that Duffy <laughs> dude. That, yeah, yeah kind of <laughs> like humor to the whole experience. Everybody else, all the other realtors are staunchy, like you said, and they are just going for more expertise, talk about stuff at the time. Yeah, part of that's just like an education thing. Mm hmm. Like, most realtors think that that's what you have to do because that's what all the realtors are doing. Mm-hmm. So you'll see that when one realtor figures out that you can get clients this way, um, like there's a mortgage broker on TikTok that has like like 5 million sub or followers or something like that. His entire business is now TikTok, just about. Um, and he does it nationally too, which is great. Um but he was the first one that was consistent with the educational type content. So he's got a lot of followers. So, so he's now, first to market. Right. So now, and probably for a few waves of that type of content worked for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But when you're, you know, in the tens of thousands of other realtors that are doing the exact same thing, you're not bringing anything new to the market. You know, there's, there's no reason why somebody should watch your videos and not somebody else's. So either you have to catch up in quantity, which you're not going to do because you're going to get bored and f- not figure out what to say, or you can just talk about something that you like, mm-hmm. like use, use your personality, find something that you enjoy talking about and just start mentioning that your realtor in there, find a natural way to do it. I think, but like me, I just make realtor jokes. Um, I, mean, I know that there's pages that do that, but I just kind of use that as my uh, marketing strategy to be a goofball. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll make listing videos with a music video. <laughs> yeah, which is smart. <laughs> um, yeah, and then beyond that, like if, if if cooking was your thing, you could start marketing yourself as the cooking realtor. I've heard of some realtors doing um, cocktails cocktails is their thing and they're gonna say hey I'm gonna talk to you about this uh, new mortgage program and let's make a uh, old-fashioned while we're doing it that's a better way to market yourself so like find something that you could do every day and not get bored and just start doing that especially with the short-form content that's out there you don't need as much uh, to get your name out there uh, just find something that you can talk about because you're going to have a tribe out there that wants to hear about it. It's more about that connection than it is about like eventually they will need to see that you have some expertise, but it doesn't need to be the way that you think about it. Being able to read a script about uh, the mortgage rates and stuff like that isn't your highest value. Yeah, it has more to do with you being a genuine person. So it's probably better for them to see the things that you like. I agree. If you like coffee, make coffee. I agree. And and you're also a person that I've noticed you don't it, you don't believe in niching down. You are incorporating yourselves with keywords like coffee, like uh, doing this, coming on a podcast, you're incorporating yourself with all the keywords that I'm incorporated with. Which is good. So I, I'd say I, I have a niche, but it's not as like narrowly defined as some might be. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of like figuring out what your genre is, so to speak. But my my niche is more like as a Spokane person. Mm-hmm. So that gives me a lot of variety to choose from. Yeah. I can talk about coffee because people in Spokane like coffee. Yeah. I can talk about local breweries because people in Spokane like breweries. Yes. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to just talk Spokane in general, but also find pretty much anything that I want to talk about and just make it Spokane related. Mm-hmm. I, if I want more business in Spokane, I could just 
start to double down on Spokane. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, have you noticed a particular time? Mm. Let's talk about like per platform. I, I, I don't pay attention to time. Mm. I've heard some people doing get really successful at it. I was talking to a creator by the name of Sam Crump. I think it was met him at a, a party. He's got like 300,000 followers on TikTok, And he said that time was super important for his growth. Um, I haven't experienced that too much. Um, I just kind of post whenever, except maybe not like at three o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> I'd say like d- during the waking hours, if it's locally related mm. and for, for me, because I focus on Spokane, I just post in Spokane time. Which I'm already, you know, living in. So that's about it. <laughs> Waking hours. Waking hours. Yep. So I figure if it's good content, it'll find its way. Um, yeah, mo- most of the time it seems like good content tends to do that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So um, let's talk about your music. All right. And how you've created beats and whatnot. Mm -hmm. How's that going? It's going good. Um, We have a listing that we're going to be working on in a week. Um, I wrote a song for that one. Okay. That's creative because you do do that. Yeah. You add add your own music video. You create your own music videos and you create your own lyrics, which is funny. Actually, I had an idea given to me by my last meeting. Uh, somebody who's thinking about becoming a realtor and they said maybe I should give a tour video in Japanese that'd be pretty funny you should <laughs> I'm think not sure you if should. I would do anything but it'd be pretty funny I think you should yeah I, cause, well I mean Mr. Beast talks about that like getting everything transcribed in the different languages and right. whatnot um yeah I've thought about that too so um what what is your thought process before you go making a beat? How do you go and make a beat? I mean, it kind of depends. Um, most of the time I have a seed idea and I just use that idea as the basis for whatever the project seems to entail. Um, sometimes it's lyric focused where I have a lyric that I thought of that I'm like, I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I start messing around with uh, musical ideas I think that could embellish on that. Um, And then I have um, sometimes where I think of a cool guitar riff and I'm like, "Ah, I like that a lot. Let's do something with that. So I'll write lyrics to that and then chords to that. Or a chord progression or a melody or anything like that. So it's it's not so much a, um, a set process other than I just know that I need my first idea and then just start to kind of discover what's inside that idea okay so you find the lyrics and then you do you write your own notes uh it depends if i'm writing choir music then uh, I'll, I'll write the notes to it um or something more particular like i've i've written a few uh like a piece for two pianos or four hands or uh i've done a couple piano clarinet violin type stuff not so much orchestra but um stuff like that i'll i'll write the notation for just because it's necessary yeah but for um songwriting stuff most of the time i'll just leave it on uh logic pro but then sometimes depending on how i feel i might transcribe it as well do you want to start a band I think it'd be fun at some point, but probably not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, raising two kiddos and um, you know ha- have a wife I like to hang out with, and um, I'm I'm pretty good just sitting at home writing music and using it for what I can. Uh, I would love more people to write for. I think that'd be fun. Um, just depending on the project, I think more choirs to work with would be fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, written a number of pieces for choirs in various areas. I think I had a couple pieces that performed in Arizona. I think someday I'll have something performed in Maine, maybe. Uh, I know I had a couple pieces pieces that were purchased in California, but I never heard 
uh, back from the director just that they purchased the music and mm-hmm. never heard from them. Yeah. So nothing too crazy. Well, cool. No, I thought about that. I was like, huh. Because so, sometimes I'll make my own beats and stuff. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Right. It'd probably be easier if I just got a hold of Jake and yeah. bought a beat <laughs> off of him. As long as it's a good one or a riff or something. Yeah. I, I, I'm, a, I'm still a novice when it comes to Logic Pro and designing sounds like that, um, which is why I mostly just do it for myself. And I, I've tr- I almost tried a couple of times to get them accepted by the, the licensing companies that uh, sell your music, but it just wasn't really my jam. Yeah, it's tough to do. So where do you see that going when the world of music and copyright and the fact that so many songs are based off of the same beat base well at one level uh it's not abnormal for music to operate like that because that's how music often did operate prior Mm -hmm. to copyright law um people would rip stuff off each other all the time Mm -hmm. that's not weird uh i mean that's in some sense why we had music rules is to create some sort of homogeneity within music systems, right? So Bach doesn't sound that different from, say, Handel or Mozart. They're basically all operating from the same set of contrapuntal uh, grammar ideas, uh, grammatical ideas. Um, So they all studied from like the same uh, counterpoint textbooks, music theory textbooks, so they're, they're all operating, like, in a sense, stealing the same ideas, but putting their own variations on it, which I think is a more accurate sum up of <clears throat> um, today's music. Like, did, what was it, the song Ice Ice Baby mm-hmm. take the riff from Queen? Oh, true. There was a controversy about that. But, like, at one level, I get it. Like that's an asset that Queen had, that the the recording company had. Um, but an- another level, like that's that's just how music works. Like that's that. So to steal the ability or to take the ability away from artists to rip off other artists seems like they're stealing part of the joy away from music by being able to do that. Because they're they're totally different songs as a whole. You know, they have one thing in common, which is that s- something like the underlying riff, right? <clears throat> like, how far are you going to take that? Are you are you going to, uh, like, are the White Stripes going to sue Billie Eilish because of similar riffs? Mm. Yeah. Doom 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 mm. doom. Then you have Billie Eilish. It's the what? Doom. Dum, 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 oh dum, yeah, dum. Uh, pretty darn similar, um, <clears throat> but those aren't the same. Like, where where do you draw the line? So, uh, I think that copyright law has a lot of issues with it. Uh, where I really think the music industry is gonna go because of all the AI innovations. Actually, before I go there, okay, um, there was a guy that saw this as a problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love this so much. This is like the most punk rock thing I've ever heard when it comes to copyright law. Which I know. Most people are probably thinking, like, how would you even have like a punk rock thing that applies to law? Oh, trust me, this is punk rock. So uh, this dude uh, used a program to identify all possible uh, melodies given one octave. Mm. Every possible melody in an octave, and he put it on a hard drive. When he did that, it was technically copyrighted. Like, it was technically its own thing. And then he put that in the public domain. Mm. Score. So that means, from that point on, any new riff is already in the public domain. <laughs> Boom! Take that. I mean, that, that just changed copyright law altogether, right? So, like, I'm not even sure. It, I'm not a law expert, but I'm not sure if you're going to be able to renew the copyright licenses on say uh beat it by michael jackson because beat it's 
melody now or uh, the riff is now in cop is now in public domain. Um, so we'll we'll see. I don't know what that means exactly, but I think that's a very curious thing that now we just have to deal with. But now we also have to deal with the fact that what I was going to say earlier is that AI is here, right? So mm-hmm. <clears throat> AI is going to start making better music than a lot of people. And maybe even compete with the greats, right? Maybe it's going to make something just as good as Bach. I mean, to some degree, I doubt it. But here's the thing that I think that the music industry is doing in general is that I don't think, this is me personally, people will probably disagree with me. I don't think art is just art because it's there. So... I don't think that a machine creating something is going to carry in the public eye the same value as somebody creating something from scratch. Mm. Which is why you can have a machine generated guitar and it could be worth a lot. But you can also have a handmade guitar that might technically be less polished but still be worth a lot more. Because there's a name associated with it, you know, when you when you have a really high class, high level name, well known name associated with a product that he is known for, or she, um, that product is still going to be more valuable than the machine made one. Mm. So what I think this is going to do is um, it's going to force music to be more grassroots and more accepting of the muddiness and the quirks of live performance because for the past hundred years we've basically been working ourselves into this uh, compose in a closet scenario right rather than where it had been which is you play either by yourself with lots of people. If you want a big sound, you got to play with lots of people. It's necessary community. Mm-hmm. I think people are realizing that's what they need. It's people realize that they were built for other people. So we're going to see music and other art forms come back into needing to be less digital and more genuine. So we'll probably get things like... Um, on video still I'm not saying that YouTube is going away anytime soon but I think people are going to look for the authenticity of a genuine experience <clears throat> and I think there's the technology to verify that it's genuine and not just a AI creation it's like I'm sure at some point AI will be able to create its own song and create the video to go along with it and even represent the, the same ideas uh, like um, quirks in a live performance sure make up its own voice make up its own song its own lyrics and, and its own recording and video um, I think that we have the technology to verify that hey this this thing was actually done by a human um, probably via um, oh shoot what is it called uh, it's like cri- cryptocurrency related but it's mm, like NFT NFT gotcha so um via the blockchain be able to verify that something was done genuinely um, by a certain person I think that technology is in there be that as it may I think that's going to make the coffee shop performers more popular cool because you have to be there so it's going to be more community driven experience experience driven rather than content driven Mm -hmm. yeah I agree and I think that people value handmade things that weren't just part of some production. Yeah, I agree. So, which leads to another question because you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but we first have to like define what is money to you? How do you define money? That's kind of an odd question. I know. Um, and while you think of that odd question, I'm going to take a piss real quick. Okay. This will surprise anybody, but money is a representation of the value that our labors produce. Um, 
No, I, I think from an ultimate perspective, money is the tool that God has gifted us with to do that task and is a genuine opportunity for uh, holy living and uh, service to God and man. Uh, so it's, it's an opportunity to um, expand one's efforts. Cool. Uh, what about influence? What is influence? I mean, kind of along the same veins. I'll, I'll probably keep on coming back to, I mean, from an ultimate level, God created influence to be a thing for his glory that men will point to him. I think that's what we were created for in the garden is that we were meant as the image of God to point to God for the rest of creation. Um, so I think in influence was built for that. Uh, and s some men have more than others. And that is their end task with it from an ultimate perspective. That's what it should be. There's an ought attached to it. Um, yeah, you know, you're manager there. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> and then uh, what about power? Uh, I mean, same thing. I mean, ultimately, all, all power is deri derivative from the creator who ha holds ultimate power. And whether it's wielded correctly or wrongly, uh, power is still derivative from him. Cool. Yep, I agree. That's true. All power is from God. Cool. Um, so what is a leader to you? Um, hopefully, and this, again, coming from biblical principles, a leader is someone who is uh, desiring to be a servant. And I don't mean that in a cheeky sort of way. I mean that the heart of the leader should be servanthood. And that's kind of shown in the thought, like, you know, the kingdom of heaven, what the king, kingdom of heaven will be like mm -hmm. is the greatest will be the least and the least will be the greatest, right? And that's what Christ shows in his leadership. He served by serving. But there, there is an element of headship to it. There is an element of um, do what I do sort of thing or... Um, pointing here is the right way but the heart of it should always be for the betterment of those that you are leading and not for self gratification cool yep so yeah so unselfishness yeah it's an important leadership trait yeah absolutely uh, so here's an interesting question what does it mean to be an American that's a tough one what does it mean to be American probably easier to be a leader than it is an American. Yeah, probably. Answer. I mean, one level, being an American is just a function of one's birth, right? Or legal status. Um, so there, there's no, like, intrinsic qualification for that other than timing. Um, timing and location. Yeah. Um, or, I suppose, desire, but there's also some luck built into that, right? Like, you, you, only so many people can become American citizens at a time or something like that. Um, but uh, as, as far as like the the essence of being an American, uh, if you're taking it from more of a philosophical perspective, um, I'm, not, I'm not really entirely sure how to take that because I think that you can take a look at the founding documents and say, well, an American should be like X, Y, and Z. Um, and of course, as a Christian, I would take more of the route that the founding documents and the, the American governance was built on the presumption that we are religious people, you know, as it's built for no one other than religious people. But um, also, the, those documents aren't in an ultimate sense authoritative. Um, so I, I don't I don't. I'm probably thinking about the question too deeply. Uh, <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that one's country or ethnicity is, is something that is ontological value. 
and that, that is something of like your internal actual substance. Like it's not just a label that you put on yourself. It's of like, you know, it, in eternity, I think that I will still be an American. Uh, That's a or, good way to put it. In eternity, I think I'll still be an American. My, my, my primary allegiance, my my citizenship will only be of heaven. Um, but I don't think that I will stop being where and who, you know, where I came from and who I was, I think is still a part of that reality. Um, so I think it's an important question. But now one that I have a great answer to. Do you feel that over the years? Like if I was to talk to like the 10 year old Jake versus the you now that that answer would be different. Like, what do you think the 10 year old Jake would say about America? Like before uh, all the political crap and I, what you have to like artfully think about saying what an American is. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to escape anything particular. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm just trying to give a real yeah, answer. Yeah, I got you. But like uh, the 10 year old Jake would probably say something along the lines of people who like freedom or something like that, which I still agree with generally. I think that's kind of a part and parcel for being American is the desire for freedom, you know, life pursuit and happiness, pursuit of happiness and all that. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah, I like that. Uh, what do you think a man is? I mean, I, I think that a, a man, again, as a uh, this, this ain't no, like, gotcha, like, oh, trans rights no. and all this crap. <laughs> like, wrong. no, it's like, what what do you think a man is? Because this is like a crisis, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I take the biblical idea that it is um, the the general principle of Scripture is that there are two genders. Uh, there could be biological ex exceptions like there are to everything, of course. But I, I think that generally speaking, the Bible talks about there being two genders. Uh, um, man is someone who generally speaking has a penis, right? Mm -hmm. And that's okay <laughs> to say, people. Yeah. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean that one couldn't maim themselves of that particular unit of their body. But it doesn't mean that you stop being a man. I think that that is, again, sorry to keep on using the word ontological, but I think mm -hmm. it's, it's becoming a more important distinction uh, in our current uh, political climate that the ontology of a thing, its actual substance, because the spiritual nature of a thing is an important, uh, necessary part of the human that we have to discuss. Um, so the internal reality of somebody and that's not determined by the self. That, that's also an important distinction. Like you're, there, there's two ways to look at life, really. One is autonomously, and one is theonomously. Mm. So our culture likes to say uh, that they are essentially the... And this, this doesn't just apply to liberals. This, this applies to conservatives, liberals, across the entire political spectrum. I, I try to stay away from the the classic labels because I think they they're they're less helpful when talking mm -hmm. about um, my uh, ultimate allegiances because it's not it's not um, political in that sense. I have political leanings, but my ultimate allegiance isn't to the right or to the left. Um, everybody and their mom <laughs> talks about uh, authority in an autonomous fashion. And you, you may expand on that to a more collective fashion, but it's still autonomous, uh, which is um, self-governance, right? The antithesis to that is theonomous living, which is to say that I'm not the one who gets to define my substance. God is, ultimately. So I can have my preferences, my leanings, my desires and whatnot, but ultimately God is the one who defines and gets to say what the ought is in any given situation because he's the ultimate definer of a thing. And if, if I make a painting and I say this painting means this, regardless of what anybody else's interpretation of it might be, I'm still the ultimate definer of my painting. Mm -hmm. So it's my contention that God is the ultimate definer of his creation 
Yeah. Have you noticed like a war on masculinity? I mean, I, I don't know if I would want to put it in that. Language, yeah, maybe not so. a war, but um, like I mean, a, I'd a say pushback. It's less of a war on masculinity and more of a war on theonomy. On theonomy, and you describe that as like yeah, how you, the autonomy versus theonomy. Right. So and this God, is good for the audience. Yeah. So God being able to say what is what. Um, you know, if, if God says um, uh, the creation of the sun and moon is a good thing then the in fact the sun and moon li- operating with their given function is not just a subjective good but it's an objective good so i can i can know definitively without question that it is a good thing so god created male and female and said it is good hmm. i can know that the male and femaleness as he created it as it stands is a good thing Mm-hmm. Now we live, do live in a fallen world. And there's going to be variance there, and, and uh, not to say there's variance in how, in this created order per se. Mm-hmm. There there are mutations and stuff like that. But um, to be able to for for one to uh, object to their biology in that sense is objecting to the created order. Mm. Yep. So, but that's and where where people I think like to get into the the weeds on this is um, even on the conservative side, they'll want to argue from what's called natural theology, which I think is utterly unhelpful. Okay. Um, Natural theology. Okay. Which which is to say like, like try to extrapolate things that God would say from nature devoid of what God says in his word. Okay. All right. Um, Interesting. So like no, no part of me, like I don't have any animosity toward people that live differently than me and they can have, uh, you know, whatever lifestyle they want. And I hope we could still get a beer and a coffee together and whatnot and still, you know, shoot the breeze and, and you know, have a friendly conversation. Um, but like, I'm, I'm going to hold fast to what I, I see as true in God's word. Um, and he identifies uh, men a particular way uh, and women a particular way. And both of those are physiological and biological. You're a true theologian. I, I, I am uh, someone who loves the word of God and, and tries to study um, theology as best I can with the limited resources that I have. <laughs> no, when I listen to you talk, you sound just like my theologian professors that I had at Gonzaga. Oh. Like they talk about the same thing ontology everything you said they talked i mean those same sort of phrases i had heard once before um yeah they're they're very common in theological circles yeah which is important Mm -hmm. and it's important to have a doctrine in which you can base yourself off of because i've been studying like so kind of like as an independent journalist, I've been following this one Waco style cult that's going down in Wenatchee, Washington. Okay. And this dude is like a sophisticated charlatan. Ooh. Like his name. What's the name of the cult? Is Josh McPherson with the Grace City Church. Now this guy is like, they're really sophisticated. You wouldn't realize it just like on the surface level on their website or anything. It wasn't brought up to my attention until like, my personal family members and enough people from Wenatchee complaining to me about this, about this church and like what they do and whatnot. And so I started doing some digging. And when I interviewed the guy who is really interested in what they're do- like, this cult is like, we need to bring about the end times. The Wait, what, what's the name of the church again? Grace City, Grace City in Wenatchee. It. On the surface, you're not going to find anything other than think that it's like, oh, like uh, just a f- fundamentalist Christian church. But it, they got most of their following during um, COVID okay. because they were the only ones that refused to like, they allowed everybody to come in without masks and that caused a big uptick. Got it. I mean, and this guy is good. This, this, their pastor, he's a great charlatan great charlatan 
he claims he's a prophet from God. Well, he says he's a vision. So that's when you know he's full charlatan. And then uh, he's good at like getting rich people to just give him land. And so he's building a whole community and everything. They do these uh, quarterly things where they take kids, uh, all these youth. And, they, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing what they're doing. It's kind of like what the Boy Scouts did. But at the same time, it's like they want to do more training than the National Guard. And his whole thing and his whole theology is based on I want to be a prophet of the end times in order to bring about the rapture and create a war with the woke mobs and hordes. Interesting. Wow. That's basically him. So, like, I'm looking forward to looking this. Yeah, he's an interesting not, guy. Not to join, by the way. <laughs> well, when I first heard about him, I was like, okay, so the Catholic Church has these things called Stations of the Cross, mm-hmm. right? Where you like go to each part of Jesus's crucifixion and you reminisce about like each part of the crucifixion, like he carried the cross, he was all that. He wanted to do something like that, but with guns. Just American oh. guns, like musket, 1775. Oh, interesting. Like to the M1 Grand, World War II, all the way to the modern, like all, all through the church. I'm like, yeah. Okay. It, oh, when wow. I first heard about it, like, okay, this, this sounds like a unique pastor. And what, either way, but you don't realize it until you start digging in. And then right. you're like, okay, this is exactly what this guy believes. And you have to like dig through his website and then you find his manifestos. In his manifestos, they, they're written kind of like some teenager with angst. And they have like these Braveheart fantasies. Like literally they into Braveheart and they believe in some... It's a lot like Islamic Jihad in a, lot, in a way. Like there's a, an outside enemy... And we're here to create this army for God. And there's one pastor. He's our visionary. He's our prophet. He speaks to God. Interesting. Wow. It's the vision. I'm very much looking forward to digging into that one. Yeah, I did a whole episode. I saw on the podcast with Dominic Bonnie. So it's one of those things. Where I'm like, hey, I might as well just get it on because my sisters were telling me all about. It. I'm like, mm-hmm. I might as well just get Dominic Bonnie on, and because he's the one who's like really hardcore in following these guys but that's something i thought about but uh i don't even know how i got there but but yeah that (laughs) but other than that yeah um you seem to have a good head on your shoulder unlike them they have no doctrine they can't speak like you josh mcpherson the the false prophet does not talk about theology he does and he says jargon and verbiage like offensive and like uh war sort of verbiage like assault you're being assaulted for being a christian every day is a war if you are not being attacked you are not serving god correctly interesting yeah it's just pure charlatanism i'm I'm very excited i i have a i i study cults on a semi-regular basis so i'm very excited to see one in my back backyard <laughs> yeah i mean yeah yeah right and went at you i didn't it's where i grew up my hometown i didn't even realize that until my family members kept bitching to me about their experiences with uh, these okay with these members because they would go to like uh uh they they'd go to like uh show up to play kind of like um the people who protest like soldiers funerals and shit mm-hmm. kind of like that got it but but they didn't do that. But but they're a very sophisticated cult. Like they got, they had all the law enforcement in on it. They had, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's no other place in Wenatchee you're gonna go and have off duty police officers armed, and you can bring your guns to church. Like it's cool. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, okay. So, um, anyway, all, all that to say about theology is I. I and a lot of people will scoff at this, and that's that's fine. I'm not going to fault them for that, any other than they're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is I, I think that um, if theology is the queen of the sciences. Um, all that to say is I, I, I don't think that we can ha- have grounds for objective uh, truth unless you're standing on the word of God first um, or the revelation of God one way or another. So mm-hmm. such that 
that when you are uh, studying something outside of the revealed truths of Christianity, I think like like I read earlier, and I was more applying this to business than apologetics, but yeah, um, the be- the the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I think that, that that applies in a very real way. That if you want knowledge about something, you have to start with God first. And I don't mean that like like an atheist can't count. But what I mean is they can't account for their counting. You know, so how, or, or any unbelieving system for that matter. So why in the world on atheism should one plus one equal two? When, and I, I know that like if you're listening to this and, and you're an atheist, and it's very easy to just kind of poo-poo that sort of idea. But I mean, if, if you're a skeptic, like really think on this for a second. Skepticize with me for a little bit. How do you know one plus one is going to be two tomorrow when the nature of reality is such that randomness brings about reality? So it could be that one plus one equals two might not be true tomorrow if that is the case. And if your brain is also the byproduct of random mutations... How would you know if what you're thinking is a genuinely true thought or just a survival thought? So again, going back to one plus one equals two, you can't really know that that's true unless it helps you survive. But survival isn't a truth thing. That's just a survival thing. So those two things aren't um, necessarily connected you know, by good and necessary consequences. Those are only by happenstance connected sometimes. Sometimes survival is not connected to truth. Sometimes survival, the best in the in a, in an instance for survival is to tell yourself a lie. Sometimes that, that is true. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you should lie to yourself, but I'm saying sometimes given certain scenarios, the best chance you have for surviving is to lie either to others or to yourself so how do you know that that's not always the case you can't so because human knowledge is always what's called contingent knowledge it always could be not the case that my or it always could be the case that my thoughts are not true given new knowledge right like um I don't think that I live in a simulation, but I could, given another piece of information that I, I don't have. Unless somebody who knows all things tells you something that is true. If God says something is true, then we can know with certainty that God said something because he said it in his word. We can know that that thing is true. So I, I, I apply that to not just morality, but to ethics and to business and to daily life. Um, you know, when I talk about why I create the TikToks that I create, you know, that's, that is because of good and true principles that I'm applying somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of a, a wild spin from where we started, but that, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I would take it. Have you ever considered that we live in the mind of the creator no because that that's not i mean I, i've considered it but that's not what scriptures talk about as mm. the reality of how things are like we have actual substance that is real mm-hmm. um and we are not a part of god we are we are ontologically we are distinct from god mm. okay that's a good that's a good point. I never even thought of that. I just thought I just thought a question. Have you ever considered we live in the mind of the creator? Yeah. And you say, okay, no. Because you have a doctrine that you are sticking to, which is good. Yeah. I, because I, I don't know these things. I don't I don't think about what I don't think about. But it wasn't until like the age of 38, like as I'm 38, and it dawned on me the scripture of Jesus. Like if you just can't pick up your mat and walk, mm-hmm. you're a slave. Well, he, he was saying it to a, a blind or a, 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 the a cripple, right? Yeah. Uh, so he he was saying more as a as a miracle that mm-hmm. was part of his uh, 
ministry of bringing the kingdom down to earth, right? Um, so that was a primary part of his ministry was was showing that the kingdom of heaven was here. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's not so much that we all have to go pick up a literal mat and go walk, mm-hmm. but it's to show, one, that Christ has authority over even physical ailments. He has authority over demonic influence, mm-hmm. um, as shown by the uh, the demons that he expelled. Mm-hmm. Um, he has authority over nature, as shown by uh, walking on the water. Um, all all these things, he, and he puts himself at, at the same equal footing as God the Father. So he's showing his authority as. Uh, a part of uh, the kingdom of heaven being here that it's entering into creation that what was solely a part of the kingdom of darkness is now and this is like John language that the light is bursting forth and that's, that's what's happened in the gospel is that there was darkness and now there's light which is like a recreation right because that's how Genesis starts What's your favorite um, disciple? Oh, favorite disciple? Well, like, I guess, mm. what's that one book that you go keep going back to in the Bible? I, mine is Matthew. I mean, it's kind of whatever I'm reading at the moment, mm. right? Uh, right now, I'm reading Matthew. Um, and Matthew, I'm finding is just... Whoa jam-packed full of just amazing goodness like and this has probably been written on before and I, I don't think that I'm making this up but you know, I've heard it said that Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels right because he's, he's very much writing to the, a Jewish audience and a lot of the idioms that he used are very Jewish um, and not, not to say the other Gospels aren't but him in particular I've heard, I haven't researched it myself, but that it's very Jewish. So it makes sense if what I'm going to say is true. Um, it's common to say that Christ going through the desert is uh, a emblematic picture of what Israel did because Christ was there for 40 days. Israel mm-hmm. was there for 40 years. So Christ is the picture of the true Israel. Right? So he, he is the fulfillment of what Israel is supposed to be in a fact, or in a sense. So at the beginning of Matthew, there's a genealogy from Abraham. You know, it says that Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of King David. So let me think about this. Abraham had a unique setup to Isaac's birth, right? Uh, Angel came and told him that he was going to have a child Um, in the new testament an angel came and told mary that she was going to have a child abraham had uh, the child a year later and um you know mary had their child both of them you know, Isaac to his potential death that God ended up stopping Abraham because you know God commanded Abraham to go and up kill and sacrifice, son, yeah. which was a common practice back then, right? Like child sacrifice was a common practice back then. Interesting. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So when God was commanding that of him, it was, um, I think, one to show that uh, Abraham's faith his dedication was at least equal to the true god as the pagans were the pagan gods um and then jesus picked up on where isaac left off and actually did die right so god being the father crushes his own son for the vindication of his children which is to fulfill the promise of abraham right um because that, that's that's what God said to Abraham, that through your seed I will bless the world. Um, anyway, and we're we're saved in the faith of Abraham as well. So when Abraham believed and God accredited 
his belief as righteousness, that's how we're saved as well. It's our belief in the true Christ that saves us, not the extra stuff that we do on top of that. Um, but then we, we get from the genealogy to the desert and then just, and then like tit for tat almost, we go from the desert to the law, like we do in the Old Testament, in the in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, then Jesus gives his Sermon on the Mount, which is basically a recapitulation of the law, not in this not word for word, but it's giving a lot of the same essence, like the same qualities as the law, um, which essentially, and you get to the end of it, it, it feels very condemning because you're like, well, shoot, I failed at all these, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, Christ. Uh, being understanding at the end says uh, essentially yes you haven't done these <laughs> yeah but then his healing ministry he goes from there and he starts healing people that have had faith in him and it, and during his healing ministry shows that it's their faith that is vindicating them and making them what they are not which is righteous um, so it seems like there's a lot of these parallels between the Old Testament narrative from Abraham, Isaac, through at least the law, like more, more so than just the desert. Like it, it, there's this big arc through Matthew that seems to have a lot of parallel accounts through the Old Testament. Um, that where Christ is basically saying, Yes, I, I am the fulfillment of the law. Did not come to abolish it, came to fulfill it. Um, so just just an amazing book. So I'll, I'll just say that I, I like whatever I'm reading. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, that was a that was a very scholarly approach to connect all those different passages back to what you 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 were main say, you were saying. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um. Now, what I was thinking of when you brought up Sermon on the Mount was I was just uh, revealed this like cool thing when I was reading the man nobody knew that it, it didn't dawn on me what the severity of what was going on at the time at this, the Sermon on the Mount. And they make it clear in the gospel, too, that 5,000 men met Jesus on the other side of that lake. And they wanted to make him king. And they wanted to run on Jerusalem and take over Jerusalem and overthrow Roman occupiers. And by the time they went to the next town, they would have picked up more people. And the next town, they would have picked up more. And they would have been able to overthrow that garrison at Jerusalem. And so where I think the miracle of the Sermon on the Mount came was when he essentially realized that if we just feed these people, they're not going to be as aggressive. They're going to eat all their food surpluses and they're going to not want to fight. And then Jesus left right after that up into the mountains. And well, he escaped. You, you'll, you'll find that like there's a multiple times through the gospels where Christ had a massive following and he'll say something that disperses the following. Mm. So yeah, I think it has more to do with an intention on uh, his divine providence mm-hmm. where, you know, it's the same reason why he speak, spoke in parables. Mm-hmm. Like he, he said that essentially this, this isn't for everyone to understand. Well, that seems odd. Um, but he'll also say somewhat offensive things, mm-hmm. right? That are very offensive things that, you know, keep on pushing people away. Well, that's very interesting that we have a Jesus that's pushing people away mm-hmm. rather than pulling people in because that's kind of what churches tend to do now, which is to pull everybody in. While Christianity is inclusive, anybody can join, it's not for everybody because not everybody wants what it proclaims. Um, you know, it is it is a belief that frees you from the moment you believe in the true Christ in a saving way but it also requires a lot of you when you're inside 
um, you know, not to say that you have to keep on earning your salvation, but what what his point is that the the person that is saved is going to desire righteousness. Um, and right living is hard. And people ultimately don't want it. So we have to keep on pressing, but depending on Christ for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're, the way is not easy. Yeah. Easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. Right. Which is very true. And um, so I wonder where, where, so let me digress. You say you, you want a, a Christ centered life, which is good Mm -hmm. as a lot of people do. So where do you see yourself in five years with this network, with everything you're going? Um, I mean, I hope that in, in five years, um, I'm doing a lot of the same things. And I used to think of creating big numbers and stuff like that in our, in our business. But I think uh, more, Often now, I'm just thinking, how can I create a stable life for my family so I can be there right now for my kids um, and be faithful with the things that I have and not worry so much about the big gains? Um, that's, that's more where my mind's at at the moment. Um, not to say that, that uh, collecting the fruit of your labor is a bad thing but I don't want to be consumed by it either. Um, So five five years from now, we're probably doing a lot of the same things. Real estate, uh, raising my family, um, networking still and selling houses. (laughs) Good. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very foreseeable future. Yeah. But brings up another point. Where do you see the given AI and AGI mm-hmm. and real estate, realtorless platforms? Where is the realtor going to go? Um, I mean, I, I think that it's going to be difficult to get rid of the realtor. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, certainly some of these platforms will take a lot of the the uh, effort out to a degree, um, and they're going to want to get paid for that. But there, there, I think there are movements within the real estate world that will help the individual agent and brokerages continue and be competitive. Um, but is, as far as like the, I, I don't think that AI is going to be able to replace what humans do in, in the industry because it's such a personal sort of deal. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but I, I just, I don't see that people would want to buy a house with a robot. Mm hmm. I don't think. I mean, pe- people do buy themselves without buy houses without realtors, but most people don't want to go to court without representation. Mm. Uh, I think that's that's mostly how people view buying a home because they're afraid to do it. Mm. That's true. That makes a lot of sense. So ha- having someone by your side, I think, helps. Good. So if you were to make a platform mm-hmm. that would replace the realtor, how would you do it? Oh, if I was doing that? Yeah. Let's say you're devil. You're the devil's advocate. <laughs> right. Um, how would I? Well, I think that I would have to focus mostly on education, right? So you'd, you'd have to create a platform where people want to engage in this themselves but feel comfortable engaging as well. I think that's going to be the difficult part because mm. you have to get um, – Again, this is my personality. Probably not everybody's cup of tea, but I, I would probably use enough humor to uh, create a place where people like to spend time and learn the process themselves. Because that's that's part of it. Is like if a consumer knows the process really well, they don't always need a realtor. But a lot of that comes down to negotiation, right? Maybe there's an instance where we need to, need to negotiate ten to twenty to fifty thousand dollars on the the home that that's often where realtors most valuable skill comes into play um or or part of it's just knowing the process enough so you're not losing that much money too um but if you can educate a buyer or seller enough to where they feel comfortable in those moments and 
not afraid, um, they're going to make better choices for themselves. But I think you can only get there if you're really confident in the content or in the information and the process. And you're not going to get there unless you're spending enough time in it to be really familiar. So that I would probably focus on the education first. If, True. You, if you can get the consumer educated and competent, then you don't need the realtor. So, okay. So if you were to make an education platform that people would be drawn to, it'd be like, hey, you don't need a realtor. I'm Jake the Realtor. I'm going to teach you why you don't need a realtor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to teach you everything you know to be successful and save money today. And you know what? I think you did. I'm pretty sure it was you who did a short or something on like how you walk through a home and you're like how to find the ways to save money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was valuable. Thank you. That's valuable. Yeah. I I think like the carpet, like, Oh, the carpet's dirty. Yep. Like 20 grand or whatever. Yeah. Um, I have to get going about like five minutes. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Um, yeah. If you, if you can find a home that, and and again, this, this is part of the value of having a, a realtor that's experienced, but if you can go into home and, uh, point out things like, hey, if you can find, say, dog smell, I like dog smell the more than cat and smoke and so forth. But really, most times you're pulling up carpets and painting. That'll take care of that. If you can find a home with a bit of a dog smell, bad paint colors inside and out, or maybe a bad paint job, uh, no curb appeal, um, stuff like that. That's like, um, it looks a little dated. And not so fresh. Maybe a little dingy. Junk is another one. If you can find a house with junk on the inside. You know, again, mo- most of your competition is going to be driven away by that. But if you can find a home with junk on the inside, you're scoring. You're making money if you can find a house that has junk on the inside. And it's only junk that's making the house worth less. Just get rid of the junk. But you could pro- you could possibly make like ten to $50,000 on the purchase if you just find a home that has funny smell or junk or whatever but I mean I'd rather have $50,000 in home equity I've done this a couple times myself too so I'm not just like talking about it I think the best way to buy a home is most often in that range okay good no that's very very valuable stuff (laughs) so um, I've heard a lot of realtors say because I've talked about it because it makes good TV uh, flipping homes. I hear that that's not the most lucrative route. I mean, it, dep- it depends on how skilled you are, right? Mm, you can okay. find a good deal. It's just that a lot of people are looking for a good deal. So, um, I think that if you are a realtor, you're going to find more opportunities most most likely. So, um, when somebody says, "Hey, Jake, I want to I want to sell my house," I have the opportunity to say, uh, "We can put this on the market, or I can buy it from you." I haven't done it yet myself, but I, I've had that possibility you know a lot of realtors do so there's a benefit to being inside that market and if if you're looking for that i'm I'm happy to help you get into the space of being a realtor that's one of the things that i I do as a service oh cool yeah no i think that's cool is like how like how do you save money Mm -hmm. on any of that that's a very valuable thing and that's coming with experience that you got all right so uh where can people find you yeah, they, they can uh, find me. Easiest is to call or text me, 509-995-4229. Uh, at the real Jake Beal on Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube, it's at the real Jake Beal, but I'm trying to change that. Um, you can go to our website as well. Uh, I think it's the Beal Group LLC.com. I have to double check on that, but it's, that's what it is. <laughs> Here, let me, let me do double check that while I'm looking at it. Um, those are the easiest way to get, get a hold of us, though. LinkedIn? I don't do LinkedIn too much. Um, I mean, I hear it's it's a good place to be, but it's just, yeah, the Beal Group, LLC.com. Okay. B E A L. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the best way to get a hold of us. Cool. Anything else you want to say to, to the audience in the world? No, I appreciate it. If you listen all the way through, appreciate you guys. Uh, and it probably wasn't what you were tuning in for, getting all that 
uh, theology mixed with business, but that's good. That's <laughs> that, what they that's mean. how I roll. Yeah, no, that's that's what's up. All right, guys. Well, thank you for watching, or thank you for listening and watching. And this is Jake. Be sure to check out all of his uh, socials in the video description below. Be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that bell for more data-driven updates. Thank you.